Welcome. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening. My name is Jonathan Phillips and I'm Chair of the Alumni Association Committee. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to our final event of the Alumni Festival, which commemorates our 2021 Alumni Award winners and the many ways in which they transform lives around them. We've really enjoyed talking to our award winners over the course of the month about connecting, adapting and the lessons learned. We hope you've enjoyed listening to the events and interacting through the festival platform. The festival has featured digital as well as live content from our inspiring award winners, with some sharing their stories and videos, such as our 2021 Alumni Award winner for transformative philanthropy, Dr. Bhikkhu Patel. Let's hear from Bhikkhu as he shares poignant reflections on the source of his inspirations and his drive. I'm absolutely delighted and humbled to be the recipient of this award. Philanthropy is very, very important to me. It's my culture, my religion. It would be very important to believe that philanthropy should be given unconditionally. It's simply about care for fellow human beings. My true inspiration in all this was, was my mother. Before we would touch any of her earnings every month, she would put away 10% of it in the charity box. I think connections is everything, to be honest. And learning from other people whose footsteps we can follow. I would say, follow your dream. I was a young guy from a minority background and at that time it was very difficult to kind of move ahead very quickly and then moved on with my brother while he was already in the business and I joined it and we expanded the business and the rest is his history. It took a lot of guts and and really determination to, to give up the comfort of my life. One of the lessons I've learned is not to get too comfortable in your environment if it is going to be a deterrent to achieving your goal. The other lesson I have learned is perhaps I have taken my life quite seriously in many ways. I worked very hard as a student. I could perhaps have spent a bit more time leisure. Without a doubt, friendship. Great to hear such wonderful insights and observations from BQ. I'm sure you'll agree, an incredibly worthy winner. Before we start today, you'll notice to the right of your screen, there are poll and chat panels. Please do get involved, take part in the poll and share your thoughts on the chat function throughout the event. We'd love to know in our poll today, why have you joined us for the festival? Maybe it's to learn something new to reflect on your time at Bristol, or possibly to hear from our inspiring speakers. We'll revisit the results later on. Without further ado, I am delighted to be joined today by our Chancellor, Sir Paul Nurse, and our interviewer, Isabel Webster. Isabel is a British broadcaster best known for her time presenting the flagship news programme Sunrise on Sky News with Eamon Holmes. After graduating from Bristol in 2005 with a degree in politics and theology, she gained a postgraduate diploma at the City University in broadcast journalism. Her career began right here in the West Country, first as a local reporter for the BBC, then as a presenter and a reporter for the regional BBC programme Points West. Isabel was then appointed as West of England correspondent for Sky News before moving to the studio to present full time in 2014. Sir Paul Nurse is a renowned geneticist and cell biologist. In 1999, he was knighted in recognition of his contributions to cell biology and cancer research. And in 2001, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine. Sir Paul Nurse has held many senior research and leadership roles, including president of the Royal Society between 2010 and 2015. And since 2011, he has been the director and chief executive of the Francis Crick Institute, a London-based biomedical research institute. In 2016, he was appointed Chancellor of the University of Bristol. And lastly, he published his book, 
What is Life?, which explores five key ideas that form the basis of biology. Without further ado, let's hear from Isabel and Paul. Well, my huge thanks to you, first of all, John, and uh, to all of you who are tuning in, a very warm welcome, and uh, most importantly, a very warm welcome to you, Sir Paul Nurse. Um, I want to start, first of all, by just reflecting on that long list of prestigious achievements that John was reading out there. And of course, you know, for, for most people looking in, they'll see that Nobel Prize in 2001 as perhaps the apex of recognition. And I am interested to know if that is what you hold the most dearly when you look back on the successes of your career. Uh, what has been the highlight and perhaps some of the challenges along the way as well? Well, it's a pleasure to be talking to you, Isabel, and a pleasure to talk to everybody, in fact. Um, of course, the Nobel Prize, big thing. But I think probably what I've really um, found the biggest highlight is the, the research that led to that prize. And, and that really is working out what controls the division of a cell from one to two. And um, we're all made of cells. Every living thing around us is made of cells. And the basis of all growth and development is the reproduction of all those cells. And when I started my career, now back in the 1970s, I wanted to solve that problem. I wanted to find out what controls that process. And um, using a combination of genetic cell biology and so on, identified the factors, the proteins that actually regulate the reproduction of the cell and lead to a, a successful cell division. I worked that out in yeast, very simple organism, very easy to work with, but then went on to show that it was the same in, in fact, all living things we can see, all animals, plants and fungi, and therefore is highly conserved and has been the controlling element of growth and development for 1,500 million years, quite extraordinary. So for that, for me, professionally at least, was probably what I um, feel most proud of. And it's interesting, you know, hearing you talk so passionately about your research and your discoveries into cells. And I wonder if that's what has motivated you throughout your career. Is it cells per se, or is it the, the joy uh, of curiosity of learning? And, and, and I wonder if you think that cells are sort of perhaps not really recognized in the world of science in the way that they, they should be. I do think cells are a very important idea in biology, and I think we should make more of them. But I think you put your um, finger in exactly the right place. Um, it's curiosity about the natural world and how it works. I, you, you, I have a seven-year-old granddaughter. She is interested and curious in absolutely everything, absolutely everything. And she talks and talks about it. She asks all these questions. And in some ways, um, scientists and academics are exactly the same. You could say we never grow up. We still behave um, like um, a seven-year-old or eight-year-old uh, child, immensely, passionately, intensely curious about the world and how that world works. So in a way, you're just looking at someone who never grew up, I would say, and is still like a curious seven-year-old. Bit of a Peter Pan. Um, I wonder though, you know, of course, the, the, the love affair with learning, with curiosity, and indeed with cells, perhaps will persist for all of your life. But as you say, you've got a granddaughter, you're in your 70s now. You know, a lot of people would say you're well entitled to hang up your boots and enjoy life. What continues to, you know, motivate you to turn up at the uh, Francis Crick Institute every day? Is it this? desire perhaps as we're in the middle of a pandemic to contribute to solving some of the world's problems or to contribute to the public debate because you've been outspoken haven't you about the way that the pandemic's been handled well i do think i'm driven mostly by curiosity of uh, of uh, this passion of wanting to know how things work but of course knowing how things work help you to do useful things as well and the useful thing is uh, a, a, an ability to think about problems, to know about how life works, who uh, actually to work out how viruses work, even though it's not something I do research on. And that's allowed me to look at the problem of the pandemic, uh, perhaps with some distance, because I'm not actually working on it. I don't actually um, study it, but I know enough about it to be perhaps impartial 
um, perhaps able to give a, a, a different perspective, perhaps because I'm not so knowledgeable, perhaps to even explain it more easily than perhaps uh, uh, some of the um, experts. And you're right, I have tried to contribute to the public debate. Um, it was very difficult for everybody, but I'm afraid we did make lots and lots of mistakes. And of course, we're all guilty of that, aren't we? When we look through our own lives, there have been failures and, and, and problems along the road. And a lot of people might be surprised to hear about you know, perhaps your upbringing, you weren't from a particularly academic family, you went to a very academic school, but some of the children there had the sort of parents that were, you know, schooling them to succeed. And you didn't have that kind of support. And a lot of people would be surprised here. You were turned away by a number of universities simply because you weren't able to achieve that that mandatory O level in French. I mean, you've got the Légion d'honneur now, so it doesn't seem to have held you back. But a surprise perhaps to some people watching this. Yes, I know. I mean, um, the, the I did. I wasn't brilliant at school, or I was highly erratic, to be more precise about it. Sometimes I was um, quite um, quite good, and sometimes I was terrible, and I could never fully understand it. I didn't come from an academic family, working class background, um, and um, you know, we didn't have many books and so on. Um, very much encouraged by my parents, who turned out to be my grandparents. But that's another long um, story. Uh, but it's quite important. It was, well, I say it was important for me um, to find life difficult to even fail. Because if you're tackling a different, a difficult problem, and um, research is difficult, then you have many failures on the way. And having failed early in life, I just got used to it and just kept going. I, I sometimes find when I have students, colleagues who have, who have soared through school, soared through university, um, when they really hit a difficult problem, they they suffer perhaps a lot more than I have done, just because from very early on in life, I um, learned to deal with things not working and to realize that you could struggle through all of that. So in a weird way, I think failure helped me quite a lot. And that's so interesting for people to hear because a lot of people, you know, will, will take inspiration from that. Um, during the festival over the last few weeks, we've heard from a lot of the other speakers talking about uh, the importance of connections. And I know that when you did your uh, inaugural speech as Chancellor for Bristol University, you had your um, old headmaster from your school uh, in the audience and, and you've stayed friends with some of your uh, peers from school as well. I wonder how much those connections you've made, whether it be in school, through your uh, extensive research in your career, or indeed through your, your wife and, and your children and your grandchildren, how that might have shaped your career over the years? A big question, Isabel, and all of the above. I mean, um, my family, they keep me with my feet on my ground, on the ground. You know, I have two daughters and my wife, and they keep me in order and stop me getting out of order. So that's always very um, good. You mentioned my old headmaster, Roy Avery, who was in um, Bristol, um, ran one of the, of the schools in, 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 in Bristol, um, was headmaster at my school. Um, which was in northwest um, London. He uh, very much um, supported pupils, including myself, realized I came from a, a non academic background, helped me, and uh, uh, very much appreciated. Uh, it, now I look, I look around me, and, and what, what do I think? What about my colleagues? You know, what really matters to me, or one of the things that really matters, is my, my students and my colleagues who work in the lab. It's just around the corner here. And they are constantly teaching me, constantly teaching me. They have the enthusiasm, the energy, um, the uh, ability to think very fast. I'm, I have perhaps low cunning, um, some experience um, of, of how things work. And this is a wonderful combination of the old with the young helping each other. And I have the privilege, the privilege, and it is a privilege, of working mainly with 20-year-olds, um, driving things forward. And I can help them, but importantly, they help me too. I, I have a very privileged life, is what I think. Uh, and of course, you know, being not just a biologist, but a geneticist as well, and I know you said it's a very long story, but people may be surprised to, to find out that you didn't know your own genetic background until quite, quite late in life. 
Absolutely right. I, in my late 50s, uh, about 15 years ago, I was working in New York. I was running a, a research university there, applied for a green card to um, uh, have residency, was turned down because my birth certificate did not name my parents. It's the one I'd had since I was born. And when I looked into it, it turned out that um, uh, my parents were not my parents. They were my grandparents. Um, to cut a long story short, um, my uh, real mother was my sister, the person I thought was my sister. She got pregnant at 17, um, was sent to her aunt. It's like a Victorian novel um, in, in Norwich, gave birth to me. And my grandmother came up to Norwich and pretended she was the mother. Nobody told me. I was never adopted, quite impossible now to imagine this, but um, I was kept in the family, brought up um, very happily. I mean, uh, really no no issues at all. My real mother got married to somebody who was never told, I discovered, um, about me. And um, when I was two, two and a half years of age, it was tragic for her, um, less so, to be quite honest, hardly so um, for me. And as you've hinted, I still don't know who my father is. There was just a blank on the birth certificate. And as a geneticist, quite a good one, actually. It's rather remarkable to find out I don't know my own genetics and still don't know my who my father is. And you spent some time trying to establish it, but, you know, just been unable to do that. Unable to do it. I've done some genetic testing, as you could imagine. I have relatives in the UK who are quite closely related to me and unknown to me. So there is a linkage. Um, I did try and contact them. They didn't respond. And I think this is very delicate matters we think about and talk about here. So I've just let it be. Yeah, absolutely. And, and such respect to your sister and your parents. It's so difficult in those days, wasn't it? Um, let's talk a little bit about what makes you you away from uh, all of these amazing accolades. We've heard a bit about your family, but I'm interested to hear how on earth you found the time to become a glider pilot, for example, to dabble in amateur astronomy. How have you managed to find the time to do these things? And you know, what else do you get up to in your spare time? Well, I, I, I'm very much an amateur astronomer. I just like looking um, at the stars, the planets. I don't do any research there. I saw Mercury last night, fantastic, just there uh, right over the horizon as the sun um, was setting. I am a pilot. I fly gliders. I've flown a lot in the Alps, for example, been very high, um, over 20,000 feet um, for ex uh, uh, as the highest I, I've been. I also am a bush pilot uh, uh, and have landed planes in all sorts of um, strange places. And do you know there's something about that flying? I should say this. When you're flying, you think about nothing else but what you're doing and distancing yourself from all the usual problems of life and thinking about research or running an institution or a university or whatever. All I do is concentrate on flying, keeping alive, keeping up in the air. And then when I come back again, back again to the earth, I can return to my normal life, somehow refresh because I've just broken everything away. So it's had quite a big impact on me and also learnt me to keep very calm in times of stress. Um, because it is a bit stressful sometimes and well, learn to I, deal with that. I can imagine it's incredibly stressful and I'm fascinated to hear that you you found that need to kind of tune out some of the noise that, that I suppose goes on inside an intensely curious brain, but not only one that's intensely curious, but also discovering things. Um, Tell me, let's go back to that idea of curiosity and, and you know, mm. these achievements that you've you've garnered over the years. We didn't even talk about your knighthood in 1999, and that was for your work into cancer research. And I wonder, you know, when, you, when you're talking to your grandchildren and, and they're so curious and interested in the world, and I'm sure in grandpa as well, you know, what is the thing that, you know, perhaps on your deathbed, you'll want them to remember you for the most? And, and um, you know, what do you think that your family are most proud of you for? Well, they'll never tell me what they're proud of me of because that would I might get above my station. I think I want to be thought of as a decent human being, probably more than anything else. Um, I, um, I, I would feel very distressed if I ever became pompous and so on, which is so e e easily happens in these situations. So ordinary, normal sort of person is probably what I would like to be thought of um, 
on my gravestone. I think and that's and what, what worries you? What troubles you when you're trying to get to sleep? Is your mind, when it's so busy, focusing on, on the research that you continue to mm. do, the, mm. the public events that are going on that we talked a little bit about earlier? Or is it perhaps the direction that the world of science is going post-Brexit? Well, yes, I did worry about Brexit. It is a bit of a problem because um, I go to sleep very easily, but I tend to wake up early in the morning and think about all the things I have to do the next day, the world's problems and so on. Um, and um, that, that I wish perhaps I, I, I didn't do. And it is, um, it's part of being very engaged with the world, both wanting to understand it and also wanting to influence it. Um, that means my brain is it's very it's really quite active. I'm one of those immensely annoying people. As soon as I wake, I'm instantly active. Is there is no nice dozy transition into be from sleep to uh, being awake. I'm straight. I'm straight in there, and of course that annoys everybody around me um, because of that. But it is to do, I'm sure, with um, always thinking about. Um, what's going on, the problems, and what I'm trying to solve. And you rise early. Just give us a window into what your typical day looks like. Are you hopping out of bed sort of at six o'clock and do you leap, lean for a cup of coffee or is that energy just coming purely based on, you know, the need to accomplish that list that you just described? Yes, I'm out of bed between five and six. I don't need Oof. tea or coffee. Oof. I I read sometimes. I go and walk around the garden. If it's the weekend, I go for a run very slowly. I run um, 10 kilometers very slowly. I do that first thing, first thing in the morning. Um, but, uh, but I don't need tea or coffee. I come back for that. I love tea, actually. Uh, but um, I'm just um, energetic without it. Very gotcha. annoying, I told you. Very annoying. I'm so jealous. <laughs> I wish I could bottle it. Um, okay, well, look, I want to put the focus finally um, onto your role as Chancellor of Bristol University. It was uh, a position that you took up in 2017, so it's been a few years now. Um, can you talk us through a little bit about what it means to you, some perhaps of your highlights of, of your time in the role uh, and any favourite memories so far? Well, the first memory of, of, of being in that wonderful hall uh, the Wills Hall in Bristol University was actually when I got an honorary degree, which was 10, 20 years before. And uh, I just wanted to tell you about that because it was interesting. I was rowed by a very old man and he told me this was his last time at doing robing. And so we had a conversation. He said, um, for many years, I used to robe Winston Churchill, he said. And then he told me all these stories about Winston Churchill. There was a little bit of whiskey involved, I have to say, in those stories as well. And I thought, isn't this really, um, really interesting? He said, um, maybe one day you'll be chancellor too. And I said, no, I don't think so. But actually, over 10 years later, 15 years later, I was. And I really like being chancellor. I, um, I like it because it's great working with the senior leadership of the university who are very um, supportive, very friendly, and um, I can um, help them a bit. I like uh, talking to the students. One of the best events was talking to the st uh, students union. And there's been, it's a real place for occasion. Uh, very early on, we had this moon in the Wills Hall. Maybe um, some of the alumni saw it. It was absolutely extraordinary. And uh, seeing this over um, uh, all the people sitting there uh, was, was uh, well, for me as an amateur astronomer, was really, um, really impressive. So my experiences with the university have been 100% pleasant. I really, really enjoy my interactions as chancellor with a great university. Um, and if you were, you know, going to give advice to anybody who's been watching this, who wants to follow in your footsteps, uh, you know, what do you think is the absolutely fundamental thing to do for a, for a life in science these days? Because perhaps not many people um, set out to follow in your footsteps, although many would like to. Um, passion, a, a passion of wanting to know its curiosity, energy, um, not afraid of failing, and never to take the advice of your elders. Oh, really? Just elaborate on that last point then. <laughs> well, you know, uh, sometimes um, you can be too easy with your advice on everybody. You've got to, you've got to plow your own furrow. 
you've got to go your own way. Okay, fantastic. Well, listen, so many people listening to this will be struck by the same thing that I have, which is that you really have managed to keep those feet on the ground, that you really do have a really um, warming sort of humility. So it's lovely to see. And as you can imagine, I interview lots of people from all walks of life with all sorts of um, accolades and achievements. And not everybody has that same ambition to be a decent, normal person. So uh, that's really admirable and impressive. And to hear you describe yourself as having low cunning uh, means you clearly have no idea of quite what you have in your own mind. Um, but absolutely fascinating speaking to you today, Sir Paul Nurse. I really appreciate you giving up the time to talk to us and I hope that everybody at home enjoyed it as much as me. Um, so thank you so very much. And I will hand back now to John, who has the results of that poll he was telling us about a little bit earlier. Thank you, Sir Paul Thank Nurse. you, Isabel. Thank you. Uh, a huge welcome. Thank you rather to Sir Paul and to Isabel Webster for a truly inspiring talk today. We apologise that we are running so tight on time, we're not going to get the opportunity to ask uh, any questions from the floor. A couple of takeaways from me. As a geologist, I am delighted, humbled maybe, to hear of the story of 1,500 million years of cell division that Paul reflected on. And I'm going to take away two words uh, from his uh, conversation today of be curious. I think I can be more curious from this point onwards. That is all we've got time for today. Thank you so much for commenting in the chat and also for taking part in the poll. Uh, we will take a quick look at those poll results. We asked you, why have you joined us for the festival today? Uh, looking at the results, they are really uh, interesting. 90%, 9-0 to hear from inspiring speakers. And I think we can all agree support was indeed exactly that today. 8 to 8% 8 to learn something new, maybe that point on curiosity or cell division. And 2%, yes, of course, to reminisce and to reflect on your time at Bristol. Great to see those results. Delighted that you took the time to complete them. We've really enjoyed hearing from today's award winners over the course of this festival and of course today, learning more about connecting, adapting and their lessons learned. We hope you've enjoyed listening to the events and interacting with each other through the festival platform. I would like to thank the Bill Brown 1989 Charitable Trust, whose commitment to education and philanthropic support of the university has helped us to put on the festival. If you've booked for today's post-event coffee and chat session, please click on the coffee and chat menu on the left-hand side of your screen, and you can join that session now. We hope you've enjoyed today's event, uh, but please let us know in the short feedback survey, which is accessible on the right-hand side of your screen. And finally, if you've not already done so, don't forget to check out the memory board and to reminisce a little bit more about your time in Bristol. Thank you all once again for joining us at the Alumni Festival. I hope you've had a wonderful afternoon, evening or morning, depending on where you are in the world. We look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thank you.